Hello and welcome to our talk, Privacy Policies Over Time, Curation and Analysis of a Million Document Dataset. I hope that you've been enjoying the web conference so far, and I'm really excited to share our research with you. So a question I have for you is, how can we go about studying privacy-related practices? So first thing you might want to do is start to dig under the hood and see, OK, what, what do we actually see websites doing to, to extract data. And this works pretty well, but we run into some problems. So issues we might run into include that there might be new technologies that come out, that new tracking technologies that prevent us from, at least for, for a time, identifying these issues until the research catches up. Another issue is that data might be sold behind the scenes. And lastly, it might be the case that we voluntarily give our data for one purpose, and then later it's used for another purpose without our consent. So how do we practice, or how do we, how do we study these practices? One thing we might do is look at documents you're probably familiar with, which are privacy policies. So these documents are published by many websites. And so uh, it, it turns out that in many cases, websites are required to publish these documents by law. Why are they required to publish them? There are a number of laws that affect privacy policies. I've briefly summarized some of them here, but there are many, many more than, than what's shown on the screen. But briefly, these, these blue ones here are European laws, and the red ones are US laws. But the main point that I want to make here is that this changing landscape really drives the need for a longitudinal study of privacy practices. So what has prior work on privacy policies found? It's found that privacy policies can be difficult for people to read. This can be because they are long, because the language is convoluted. And another thing it's found is that even when people are able to read them, the disclosures are often inadequate. So, in terms of longitudinal data, it turns out that prior work has, has looked at privacy policies from a longitudinal perspective, especially with respect to GDPR. There have been a number of papers looking at how GDPR has shifted the privacy policy landscape. But even earlier than that, there were a few papers in the early and mid-2000s doing longitudinal comparisons of privacy policies. So what does the data set landscape look like? So there are a couple of small, very well annotated data sets. And there are also a couple of very large, uh, less annotated data sets. But our main point is that many of these data sets are collected with a single time point in mind. And in contrast, what we present is, to our knowledge, the largest longitudinal study of privacy policies both in time scale and also among longitudinal studies in the, large, in, the, in the number of documents. So in our analysis, we look into uh, readability and length, so comprehensibility. We help to contextualize GDPR, and we also look into disclosure within privacy policies. And we also look into self-regulatory bodies. So what does what, what does our longitudinal data collection look like? So we divide time into six month intervals ranging from 1997 all the way through 2019. 1997 is the beginning of the Internet Archives recording history and 2019 is the, the latest time we could collect from given when we collected our data. Um, so we collected around, um, so, so we, we collected our data twice per year, so six month intervals, and we tried to collect as close as possible to the midpoint of those six month intervals. Our target set, so the set of websites that we were trying to collect from was websites that were in the top 100K at any of those midpoints 
ranging from 2009 to 2019. 2009, because that's when the Alexa top million was started to be published. So what does our data collection pipeline look like? First, we start with the set of websites, our target set of websites from Alexa. Then we try to download their homepage, homepage snapshots from the Internet Archive. And then next, we try to extract just the English language uh, snapshots. And from those snapshots, we extract privacy policy links. And then after that, we try to download those privacy policy links. And then we pull out the privacy policies from those downloaded pages. And lastly, we filter out documents that we believe are not actually privacy policies. So our data set is available online. You are more than welcome to, to play around with it and to try to conduct your own studies on it. And we strongly encourage you to do so. The links are in, in our paper. So that might be the, the easiest way to grab them. As far as cleaning the data goes, so I mentioned that we removed documents that we did not believe for privacy policies. How do we actually do that? We trained a machine learning classifier to handle that problem. So what we did was uh, our, our classifier was a random forest model and it was trained on engrams from both the text and the title and it had an, a precision of about 98% and a recall of about 94%. So that gave us our million, 1.07 uh, million documents. But for the purpose of our analysis, we felt that it was important to remove some documents that were real privacy policies, but pollute, might pollute our analysis. And those documents were highly redundant privacy policies, things like park domains or cases where home pages redirected to another home page that was in our data set or a privacy URL redirected to another privacy URL that was in our data set or policy URL, I mean. So what does our data set look like in terms of composition? So it's about 910,000 policies after deduplicating. In terms of category distribution, we show that here. The major outlier here, this uncategorized data, is sort of a catch-all. We see that our data is pretty underrepresented in that category. But otherwise, the representation of our data seems to be fairly uniform across the categories uh, relative to, to the whole set of websites in that category. So another thing we note is that much of our data is from 2010 or later, and that a lot of it is in the long tail. So the half of our data is in this interval, another half of our data is in, so half of our data is 100K and later, uh, an overlapping half is, is 10K to 1 million. So that's worth noting. Another thing that's worth noting is that if we try to download a, or when we try to download a top website, it, we are more likely to get the data, but there are fewer top websites. So revisiting readability comprehension, we calculated the Flush Kincaid grade level uh, for many websites. So Flush Kincaid grade level uh, pops out a number which is meant to correspond roughly to the, the school grade level. So this would be roughly the end of high school in the US, and this would be around the time of, of university in the US, early university. So we stratified our data by, uh, by popularity, and we note that more popular websites have more difficult to read websites. And we also note that over time, the trend has been gradually trending upwards in terms of difficulty to read. Similarly, we, similarly, we looked at the length of privacy policies, and we note that privacy policies have been getting longer over time. Again, more popular policies or more, more popular websites have longer policies, but generally the trend has been longer. So we also wanted to look at changes in privacy policies. So first, we looked at the policies themselves. So how uh, 
uh, how many policies received an update each each interval? And what we see here is this big spike uh, right around GDPR in the number of policies that received an update. And we also took a slightly different approach here where we looked at the language itself. So we looked at engrams and we saw when there was a major shift in the usage of an engram. And again, we see that around the time when GDPR is implemented, there's a substantial shift in the usage of various engrams. So given that there's all these changes in trends in, in language, we wanted to actually look at some of these, these trends. And we wanted to try to do this with, with the minimum researcher bias that we could, we could achieve. And one way we thought to do this is to try to generate uh, at least ideas for trends automatically. So how do we do that? We took the entire set of engrams from this data set and we removed the low frequency engrams and then we scored and ranked all of the remaining engrams uh, based on a number of heuristics and we took a look at them and uh, showing a sample here these were the top engrams for a couple different heuristics and we see some interesting things right off the bat for example we see some things related to gdpr Legitimate interest, legitimate interest is probably related to GDPR, for example. GDPR is almost certainly related to GDPR uh, and the EU and possibly EEA, EEA are related to GDPR. Google Analytics and Facebook are probably related to third parties. May collect and may include, uh, indicate some things about ambiguity in privacy policies, which is interesting. <clears throat> so the trends we decided to look into uh, first, we started with, with self-regulation. So self-regulatory bodies, we divided into two, two different types. So on this side here, we have first party focused ones. So these are privacy seal companies that uh, allow first parties to indicate that they comply with certain privacy practices. And on the left here, we have industry trade groups that, um, that, that are organizations of, of advertisers that, that are third parties, not first parties. And we noticed that these third party groups are growing, whereas these first party groups are stagnating. So we also looked at reporting of tracking technologies and we compared it to prior work measuring these tracking technologies in the wild. So we looked at cookies and we saw that cookies were pretty on track with prior work. But on the other hand, when we look at web beacons, we, we see that there's a substantial gap between reporting and between, uh, so, so what was reported and what was found in prior work in the wild. We see similar thing with fingerprinting and uh, one thing we note is, is the difference in reporting between the 1K, the top 1K, and the entire set. And we also note somewhat of interest this, this spike that was after the paper came out. So after that, and finally, we looked at third party reporting. So uh, which third parties were reported, how frequently, and how did it compare to in the wild observations? So these are specifically in a tracking context. So how often was Google observed in a tracking context? So we see a substantial gap between, for example, Google observations and Google observations in a tracking context and Google reporting uh, in any context. Similarly with Facebook and similarly with Twitter. So uh, thank you for coming to our talk. Uh, I want to thank my co-authors and I want to thank everyone else who's helped us along the way with this paper. And I hope that we will see you at the Q&A session. Thank you.